Welcome to Listening to Paint Dry with Mike and Dan, a podcast about the art and hobby of miniature paint. I'm Mike. And I'm Dan. I'm glad you can join us today as we continue our quest to become better, braver, and happier painters. So today, we want to talk about brushes. We'll see if we can uh, put an end to this big debate, but I got a feeling it's not going to work out. So as you've seen on Facebook groups here and there, it's always a day or maybe five times a day where someone's saying, hey, what's the best brushes out there? And people throw recommendations out there. And before you know it, there's insults and hurt feelings. And you really don't know what the best brush is at the end of the day. So today we're just going to talk about some of our favorite brushes. Yeah, man, people are super passionate about their brushes and incredibly brand loyal especially when you're talking about the Kalinske Sable brushes. You also get those people who say they paint only with synthetics, but that's that's probably a whole other show, uh, synthetic brushes, etc. So kind of the main ones that we hear about are the Raphael 8404 watercolor brushes, Winsor Newton Series 7, the regular, not the miniature. Most people who paint miniatures don't use the miniature sizes. And then Rosemary and Company is a kind of a new company. They're, because of their lower prices, a lot of people love them. What do you look for in a brush? Uh, so I, I have small girly hands, so I do like a, a thinner handle than normal. Um, I like my brushes very light. I do like my bristles to be fairly stiff and firm, though. Um, I don't know how I got into it, and I think it's because of the way that I'm painting and I might do my brush strokes. But I find that uh, some of the more relaxed, uh, higher quality um, water bristles are are too flimsy for me, where I can't get certain, I can't use it for certain techniques. So that's what I'm really looking for in a brush. Um, I know that when you, I mean, we can go into different size brushes and how they compare between different companies and manufacturers, how one can be a size two and be compatible to a size zero in another manufacturer that also will change the sizes of your, your handles. I usually just go for feel. I'll, I'll I'll find one or two that I really, really like. Uh, I'm lucky enough that we have some game shops around here that have some of the more um, prestigious paintbrushes on hand. So I can try them out, especially if it's a new one, I really want to feel it and see if this is something that, that weights and feels properly in my hand because if it's not, you're not going to be comfortable on how you're going to really want to paint properly if you're not being comfortable. Yeah, that's a really good point, Dan, that there is no universal size sizing. That like any company's the sizing is based on their own standards, not on a comparison to other brush companies. And so, like for your example is great. Like a Raphael Zero is typically about as big as a Windsor Newton One. It, you know, you just got to get a feel for it in what you like. I mean, that, that is an excellent point. And see, I'm a little bit different in that I go for the softer tips that I, I are softer brushes with a bigger belly on them. And I like that kind of lends to the way that I paint, which I, I paint with a lot of super thin glazes and I do a lot of feathering, et cetera. And so for me, it's a little bit easier to do those techniques with a brush that has a bigger belly and I can paint for a little bit longer. So that's kind of the way I go. But I also like my brushes, like I like my pens and I like, I like heavier handles. And so I'm a big guy. I'm almost six foot five. I got pretty big hands. And so I like something with a big, like something with a little bit of weight into it and a weight in the handle, et cetera, et cetera. So different strokes for different folks, right? And that's appropriate for this because of brush strokes, et cetera. So when, when you pick up your brushes, man, what are the ones that you kind of go to? Well, strangely enough, um, I don't go for the, the big manufacturers. So my number one brush right now, strangely enough, is the one that I got at Nova Open last year from the Game Envy guy. I don't know what the name of his brushes are, which makes me suck. But they're all named after different kinds of swords. And I think maybe they're just Game Envy Kalinskis. And they are just firm enough and they have just the right tip for me and the right size, and I I love these brushes. I ha- I really, really enjoy these. Um, they are probably how I felt about my Windsor & Newtons when they first came out, but for now, I'm using those, and I'm actually using my Rosemary & Company. I'm using the Series 33 right now, 
and I'm really digging that brush also. They're kind of close. Uh, the Game Envy one has a little bit wider barrel on it, but I really, I, I like the way that feels. But the, um, the Series 33 from Wismary Company, I really like that one also. So those are my, really my go-to at this point. And my cue, when you say that, uh, if, you know, if I'm going to do glazing and, uh, some light layers and stuff, I will use some of my other primarily watercolor brushes or brushes that have lost their tip, um, and use those. So, Right now, I'm actually using Dick Blick Masterstroke. They were on sale for like a dollar or two dollars a piece. And I was like, well, you can't go wrong. I really like these also. Um, they don't keep the tip as long as I would like for them to, but they're really good for, for water, um, water coloring. Uh, cause I would do that, you know, when I'm not painting figures. Um, when I'm putting, uh, glazes down and washes, they're really, really good for that. And then they use my older brushes also for that. So those are the main ones that I'm using right now. I do have a Da Vinci. Uh, my Raphael was my my first great love, but I don't think they make manufacture those the same way they used to. And we could probably go into a whole conversation about uh, the quality of the Winsor Newtons and the Raphaels and how that it may have changed in the last couple of years. I have noticed a huge difference in it, and maybe. Maybe it's quality, but maybe it's just the way that I'm using the brushes and the way that um, I prefer my brushes um, to be. So maybe that's why I've noticed that they're not to the same standard as I want them to be. So I really don't use them that much. So what about you, Mike? What kind of brushes are you using? So I definitely don't. I want to put a, put a mark on that for you. Though I do want to talk about that. The, the different batches in production though a little bit in, in a little bit here but um so that's a good point that's a good point by you so i kind of have five main brushes in my arsenal three of which i've been using and actually these exact three brushes i've been using for well over a year now and they are the raphael one zero and on occasion when i'm doing really super fine like freehand or black lining i bust out the two sli uh, two odd zero or the two odd how i always say that wrong um, and that's the smallest brush that I use, but that's also a very rare brush. And then I've got two new brushes that invaded my kind of rotation, and I kind of fell in love with them. And I'm going to give some props here to Vince Renturella's review of these. He did a hobby cheating review of the Bombwick Igniter by Slow Fuse Gaming. I got to tell you, the one and the zero are workhorses. Um, I enjoy those brushes a great deal. All, all five of them, my main brushes, I've had for a while. I had for a while, but I, I, I will put this caveat there. I do, I am a weekly brush cleaner, and when I paint, I actually have three pots of water. I have a pot, uh, a mason jar that has a mix of water and pink soap in it, a clean water jar, and then a final water jar. So I kind of do the rinse, rinse out there. I do it in soap. Soap water, rinse out the soap water, and one more rinse. And so, yeah, I'm I'm particular about that. But what I was finding is that because I was using such thin paint, and the way that sable brushes act act because they have a capillary action, so the thinner the paint, the further up that paint is being drawn. And so I was like, why? It's taking me forever to clean these brushes, you know. And it's because it was pulling it all the way up to the ferrule, et cetera, in certain colors. Like, good lord. Turquoise takes a month and a half to get out of a damn paintbrush. And I was painting a, a, an army, basically, when I was attempting to be a gamer <laughs> of turquoise-colored uh, knights, basically. Um, so those are my five main brushes that I use. Uh, probably four of them are the big workhorses, but I don't use, I, I don't really go for anything smaller than the two zero, except for, that, that's for like doing eyeballs and black lining, like I said. But one thing I've noticed, so I have a bunch of different table brushes. I also have the Artist Opus brushes. I have Rosemary and Company brushes. I have Series 7 Windsor Newton brushes. I have a couple of off brands, one called Virtuoso that those were in a nice set. It was actually a great price and they're okay brushes, but they have a wicked guide hair on them. And that's that one little hair that sticks out and you're like, Oh my God, why won't that go away? What's wrong with these lines? I can't get it. I can't get a proper tip. It's because of that stupid guide hair, um, which you can just gently clip off. But anyways, I digress. You shouldn't cut the tip, Mike. Well, no, you just got to cut the one hair, one hair, one, just one hair. hair, just one hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I don't, don't cut the tip off your brush. That's a, that's a bad idea. 
So anyways, the main thing I think for me for those those five brushes that I use is probably a comfort thing that now I've gotten in the habit of I, I know how those brushes paint, I know how I want to paint, and those kind of react the best. The truth is there's no right answer to this, right? There like you gotta find the way you paint, find the tool for how you paint. But uh one of the things I did notice, and you know what, you and I kinda had different effects of this. So when I ordered the, I had the same issue with Rosemary and Company brushes that I have with Winsor Newton brushes. And I don't know if this is a bad batch. And you know, everybody plays that damn video, Winsor Newton. These are how the brushes have been made forever. And I'm like, I'm kind of skeptical of it. You know, I've seen it, like I've already seen it posted, but you know, like I have one Winsor Newton. I have a size zero Winsor Newton that paints well. And sometimes I'll use it if I can't find my other brushes and that's fine. I don't have a problem with it, but. Every other Windsor Newton I had looks like a damn troll doll halfway through the first use. And this is me well, that's being... because you're using, well, that's because you're using squirrel butt hair to paint. And maybe those are just a little curlies down there. They just, you know, from creature to creature, they're going to be a little different. So maybe the quality from last year might be a little different from this year. Maybe there wasn't enough food. Maybe the temperatures changed too much. He didn't take a bath the day he got caught or something. I, now, now that I think about it, there's so many different ways and that and so many different things that can change the quality of these brushes just by the, the animal itself that, you know, it, I don't know how the quality control. I guess they must have it pretty good because they're able to do this for hundreds, hundreds, a hundred or so years. But man, um, you're just trying to get totally... me to say rodent ass hair. That's exactly what. I said squirrel butt hair, didn't I? It sounds like an eight, like you know, the early nineties. Wasn't there a, a ska band called the Squirrel Nut Zippers? You know, like maybe they should have been the Squirrel Nut Zippers. They're hair. still around. <laughs> Are they still around? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I remember that song, hell, too, like hell, hell to Pay or something like that. Just Hell. I Is have a CD. Oh, you have a CD. <laughs> nice. That's how old I am. That's I have okay. it on cassette too, and vinyl, nice, and tape. No, eight track. I don't. I I know. I know. I played that song for my kids at some point, but because uh, it is it is pretty funny. Um, so, but yeah, like, but you had the same exact experience though with Windsor Newton or with Raphael's that I'm having with Windsor Newtons and the Rosemary and Company brushes, right? Mm-hmm. I, I have, and I, you know, like I, I mentioned before, I wasn't quite sure if this was me picking the wrong ones or me just realizing that it's not how I wanted my brushes to be. So I might have to look back at them again. I mean, I have one right here. The bristles are pretty limp. Maybe I just had it for too long and it's just wearing out uh, compared to some of my newer brushes. And that could possibly be it too, because I do try to take care of my brushes the best I can. I don't wash them as frequently as you do. Um, but I'm, you know, I do use regular water and I'll use the soap on them every once in a while. Um, so I try to take care of them. And this brush is, you know, this one right here that I happen to have is pretty damn old. It's probably five or six years old. So it might be losing some of its, uh, stiffness and that might be all right. But I've also noticed if I go to a store and still try to, you know, figure out what it is, you know, how, how, how stiff the bristles are and everything without having to lick it or anything like that to get whatever the paste is they want to make it all firm, um, they still seem to not have that quality that they used to. And mm-hmm. I, it just, maybe it's a cycle. Maybe it's a quality control issue. Maybe it's just me. I really don't know. I, I'm i not hard and firm to a particular brand. I go and try a bunch of them out and I like it until it doesn't work anymore or if something better comes out. So that's, how the that's how I ended up getting the game envy ones is we were walking around and you know he had a bunch of them there so I was like well let me see how this brush feels and I was like holy crap and I think I even asked if there was the the putty or whatever it is on there and he's like no it's not on and I was like holy crap so I bought them that afternoon and I love the crap out of them because they're just right just for what I need for my painting. And it might not be for everybody else, but they surely hit the spot for me. We're, you know, and that's that's exactly the point of kind of this conversation. And when you read through those through those Facebook posts of everybody, I don't know, preaching about their brand, figure out your style. And you know what? The other side thing too is that you might come back to a brush 
Like you may not like a brush right now because it doesn't fit your style, but your style may change to where that brush later on might be something that works. For you. And so it's all, it's all a process and it's all part of the fun of becoming better and braver and happier is that you find the tools that fit the need for you right now. You have tools later on that you might adapt to, et cetera. But I tell you, um, it just like brushes are like office supplies. Um, I love paint brushes. I could, if there was like a vendor hall that was just paint brushes for like a convention, I would be there the entire convention trying out every brush because I just, <laughs> I love, I, I just like office supply. My addiction to office supplies, I love brushes. So, and I just ordered, uh, I just part of a Kickstarter that I'm backing right now. They have an add-on for three of the green stuff roll Kalinsky sables, and it's only seven dollars to add three different brushes. And I'm like, all right, fine, I'll try those. Two. Oh, really? Oh man, yeah. I have to get on that because I succub- definitely want to try. It's the succubus uh, by Tago. Oh, Major. that one. Oh, yeah. you know, I was thinking about doing that one. I just couldn't figure out what size to get for. Uh, I'm I'm going with the smaller one. I'm going with the 54 millimeter one, and then oh. I added and I added the plinth. The main tag and the brushes. Okay. Um, I mm, might add the paints because as we've talked about before, I'm a bit of a paint slut. And so more paints sound awesome. <laughs> well, since you were talking about, um, Kickstarters last year, I picked up one of the, um, Kickstarters for a paintbrush called Ghost Brushes. And, uh, if we have a couple of minutes, I'd like to talk to you about them just to let you know how I felt about them and how they do. So this is a Kickstarter. I think it was in January. Um, it was pretty cheap and inexpensive. You know, I, you know, I do have my, my Klinsky tables that I, that I normally use, but for the price, I think it wasn't much, maybe 16 bucks, maybe, maybe not even that. And I got eight different brushes, but then since we hit, uh, a certain um, threshold. I can't remember what they're called. Um, he doubled stretch the goal. size of the stretch goal. Yeah, it's a stretch goal. So I get 16 brushes. So these things, I got an awful lot of them. Now, these are synthetic, and they're all white. So it's uh, silver ferrule, painted white, white bristles, and it's synthetic. And the first time I used it, I wasn't uh, wasn't thinking very much, and so I pressed pretty hard on it. And uh, I broke, or I didn't break the tip, but I, I bent the tip up because it's they're nylon brushes, and I was pretty bummed at first. I was like, well, you know what, you know what did I do, or what is wrong? So I put them away for a while, and I brought it back and got grabbed one of the other ones, and I took a little bit more care for it, and I was actually fairly satisfied with it. It kept its shape pretty well. You know, I haven't had any problems with the the tips bending because I'm trying to use them properly. Since they are white, they don't clean that that well. So um, it is kind of interesting to see the different colors that that uh, to make particular colors. So if you dip your brush in an orange, and then you have like 15 different colors stream out of it, or you can see it on the brush itself. Um, it's kind of funny, but um, I do use them. I use them um, not as much as I should, but I do pick them up, and I have at least three of them on my table. That if I need to pick up and if I want to experiment with them, I will like, oh, you know, what what can I do with these with the oils or what can I do with these with with my acrylics? Just to mess around and, and give them a try because, you know, um, the guy put them together and it did a pretty decent job. And he also has a, I guess he did well enough that he hasn't had another Kickstarter for his dry brushing brushes. And so I'm going to pick those up also. Uh, I guess I'll be here in a couple months depending on how long it takes for the virus to get away. But I was pleasantly surprised. And I wish I could figure out how to buy these things now, because I'd definitely be telling people to go pick them up, especially if you want something kind of inexpensive, something that's pretty decent, better than just going to you know Walmart and just dropping a couple bucks there. These are pretty much the same price, if not cheaper. Yeah, I mean, you gave me a few of them to use too. And I have to tell you, I, I thought they were pretty good. I, I mean, they didn't, you know, eventually the they started to curl um, because that's what synthetics do. And, you know, a little bit of a plug for later in the episode, I talk, we have an interview with Jason from uh, Monument Hobbies slash Slow Fuse Hobbies, uh, Slow Fuse Gaming slash Creature Caster. 
And uh, he, we talk a little bit about synthetic brushes and the curl. And part of that is user error that you keep stroking the same way. And so what happens is you're teaching the brush because it's plastic to paint that way. And so you're actually kind of subconsciously doing it. So you got to keep rotating the brush as you paint with it to prevent it from doing it. You know, you want to change your, make sure you change your strokes. Right. You got to, you got to switch that stroke up, you know, that's (laughs) That's the best, that's the best way to do it. Uh, Yeah. No, I, I liked it. You know, I thought, I, I, didn't you tell me that he made them white for training reasons? I cannot remember. I don't remember what happened yesterday. So no, I can't remember. Yeah, what. I think you. I, I think you told me that he made them white so people could see where their paint was and not going up any further. Like you know, I a, think that's a fantastic reason, and that is why he made them all white like that, so that you can see where the paint is on your brush, so that you don't get it all in the furrow, furrow, and and mess it all up. <laughs> <laughs> that's your story, and you're sticking to it. That's right. <laughs> But yeah, that's uh, you know, they're, they're they're pretty good brushes, you know. And if you get an opportunity to support a small business and that's got the right idea in mind and getting you know decent brushes out for a decent you know decent low price, what the hell, right? There's nothing. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. No. Hey, and one last thing, he donated uh, one brush for every backer that he had to the Phoenix Children's Hospital, which I think was pretty cool. And that was thirteen hundred brushes that he gave to kids to help them get through what they needed to and just expand the hobby in the community. And I think that was a pretty stand-up thing. And I believe his name is Jeff. So I'm going to say, hey, Jeff, that was a pretty cool thing. I'm pretty sure you do it with your dry brushes also. So let's get those kids um, some paint in time. That's badass. That's a good, That's a, you know, it's a wonderful thing about this community is I feel like a lot of times people don't forget that there are others in need and there's a beauty to art. And so giving art is a huge gift to people. So congratulations to ghost brushes for doing that. That's pretty, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. I thought so too. And he doesn't like really push it either. He doesn't, you know, he just does it out of his own heart. I'm like, Hey man, good on you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Dan, I mean, what do you think? Have we, have we put the, the brush debate to, to bed here? Uh, absolutely not. People are still going to be, <laughs> people are still going to be fairly, um, people are going to be fairly loyal to the, to the brands that they use. And once a new brush comes up and it really does shine, uh, then they may sway a little bit and, and try those, and try those brushes out. And there's nothing wrong with trying things out. There's some really cool brushes out there that I've never touched. Hopefully someday I can get a hold of them and give them a try. I know which ones work for me now. And I'm going to continue using those. And everybody's a little different. So, that, you know, give things a try. I know it's a crappy, cliche thing for us to say, along with becoming a better painter means you have to practice a little bit more. And a lot of people don't like hearing that. But, hey, that's just the reality of it. Right. True. So, it's true. Right. Yeah. And we will probably get into a whole episode or two or three episodes about that because we could talk forever on it. But um, give something a try, and it does make it a lot easier. Hey, you know, go see if you have a friend who's painting with you, or you go to a hobby shop and you see somebody has a a type of brush. Just say, hey, can I check it out? You know, they'll be more than happy to talk to you about the brush, especially if they like it. If they don't like it, they'll probably give you their opinions on that also. Uh, but they'll tell you, hey, I really like this brush. This is my favorite brush. You should go out and buy this brush. But you have a chance to touch it and feel it and see if it's something that really fits with you. Because, you know, those brushes that have like triangles on them and everything or ribs on them and stuff, that just doesn't feel right. And not to me, but it might be to other people. And somebody invented it and invested money in creating something like that. Couldn't be just for one or two people. So give them a try. Practice a lot with them to figure out which ones work best for you. Right. And and. The artist makes the tool. The tool does not make the artist. And that's kind of something important for people to remember is that, you know, it's all, it's brushes. You'll find the brush that adapts to you. Don't find a brush that makes you do something. You know, and that's, I think that's really in the end what, what the most important thing about the debate is. The winner is, is, is us because there are a bazillion choices for brushes out there. And you don't have to stick just to hobby brushes. You can, of course, go to an art store and find what they are what what they have to offer. And a lot of times art stores have their own sable lines of brushes. Like you said, uh, Dick Flick has their 
Um, I think Michaels at one point did too, but I don't know if that exists anymore. And so, oh, we can go to a, we can bring up a whole world <laughs> of just uh, craft store brushes, which right. you know I started with many years ago. But those are the only brushes that really they had before I knew about the the exclusive brushes. Um, and mm. they worked fine. They worked fantastic. Um, I still have a couple of them. Every once in a while, I'll pick one up. Hey, if I'm gonna buy one and get one free for three or four bucks, of course I'm gonna try to grab a a one or or a zero brush just to give it a try. Hey, it right. might work out pretty good. And if it doesn't, I still got a brush that I can use for lining or uh, stippling or something. Exactly, and that's that's what the beauty of this is: is that there's so many different options. So many different styles of brushes, you know, and that's, it, it's great, you know, uh, being a Bob Ross fan, you know, I dry brush with a lot of, I have a, a few different fan brushes that I use, so I'm not just, I, I don't just need the pointed round, you know, <laughs> but, uh, nerd. yeah, I know, I'm a nerd, what can I say, you know, but such is life. And it uses makeup brushes too. <laughs> I do, I do use makeup brushes, yes, I do. You do, for what? Dry brushing. Oh, that sounds like a fantastic idea. Actually, it's kind of the rage now, man. You get it. You need to get hot. Get on that YouTube, as, as Bernie Sanders says, the YouTube. You know, I have to get on the YouTube. And... The YouTube, right? And, and that's uh, Uncle Adam, who we had as the second interview on the show, and also uh, I know Vince Venturella has an episode on it where he talks about using only makeup brushes and his hobby cheating, ser- cheating series and. Honestly, you can get damn near almost airbrush type transitions with some of these makeup brushes and they're dirt cheap too. And so it's kind of cool. It's an, you know, it's an, it's that crossover of things. You talk about 2D and 3D art and canvas painting and such and techniques adapting to miniature painting and then all, all, you know, cats and dogs living together and the world ending. And, uh, but no, you can use. Yeah. Makeup. Let's not talk about the world ending because we're pretty close to that right now. But you not be you might be telling me the next thing you the next thing you're gonna tell me is uh you're using fingernail files too. Uh, I am. I actually oh. go to I go to the nail salon actually there's a Sally Beauty and I actually go buy my uh emery boards there. I'm disappointed in you, Mike. Why? They're so much cheaper. Emery boards. I buy well emery they're boards. I don't know what else you'd call them. I mean there there's there's these boards that have uh, four different textures on, or four different grits on them, and they're perfect to follow the progression and get rid of a nub. Or then they have polishing bricks, and so especially in the, going into this world of Gundam and getting rid of, rid of seam lines and getting that kind of factory finish on them. Yeah, the the the, the beauty store is the way to go, <laughs> and they're cheaper. Mm-hmm. And they're cheaper than hobby stuff. Okay, so guys, if you. Uh... <laughs> If you ask for a gift card <laughs> for your local uh, beauty salon, um, maybe that's not a bad thing. Or gals, if um, all right, the if next your time, bows, if your bows are asking for gift cards, <laughs> maybe it's for them and not for you. I don't not for you, right? <laughs> no, next time, next time that we uh, we get together, I'm going to bring these with me and I'm going to show you. I'm going to convert you to both makeup brushes and uh, the beauty supply store. For these things, they're they're great. They're also yes, great. Yes, Mike. We'll we'll, we'll 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 go together to a beauty supply store. Yeah, that'll look right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? Today, though, you know nobody, you know nobody's going to say anything in today's world. That's wonderful. So, do you want to talk Possibly. about what's on your desk? What you're working on? Oh my gosh! So, since I've had all this free time, I really haven't had a whole lot of free time, but. So, strangely enough, I started a vacation just before this all happened. I think we might have talked about that last episode. So, I was I had free time to actually just concentrate on doing some things. So, I'm trying to figure out non-metal metallics again um because there are f- some space marines that I that I want to paint up. Uh, I'm getting a little frustrated with them though. Because they're old metal ones, so the lines aren't very crisp, and you have to sand for like 20 minutes with your emery boards to get them uh, flattened out, and it's or a freaking file to get the freaking marks off the guys' heads or their shoulder blades aren't lined up properly or something like that. So I've been working on that, uh, playing around with the sisters a little bit, not as much as I had before. 
Um, the uh, my dark angels have reared their ugly head again, so I got about fifteen or so Deathwing guys waiting for me to finish them up. Um, and uh, I was playing with some um, some Gundam stuff the other day. But I got bored of that real quick, so I decided to put it, put it back in its box and not play with it because I wanted to concentrate on painting my guys. Since I have like five thousand freaking space rings that I need to paint someday. Uh, so that's what's on my desk. What about you, Mike? What you uh, you're you you're, you're forgetting a major one that we had a conversation. Oh, I can't about. remember. Uh, the battleship Yamamoto. Yamamoto. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. The Gumpo thing. I didn't. Um, oh, that's yeah. a, that's you, you consider that Gundam? Oh, okay. Uh, Gundam. It, uh, uh, it, it's probably not. But if I type in Gundam spaceship, that would probably pop up. But right. Um, I um. So yes, that's what I was alluding to. I just okay. kinda, <laughs> I didn't know exactly okay. what to say and call it. So um. So that, and then hey, I have my three D printing thing that I'm doing. So I'm printing out uh, all kinds of test prints on Space Marine stuff or other little things and trinkets around the house, um, just to give it a try and push it to its limits a little bit. Um, actually, you know what? I'm getting kind of bored of it. Didn't think I'd say that, but it just doesn't. It doesn't scratch that itch as much as I thought it would. Um, so I was still. Pill around with a little bit, but I'm not doing doing as nearly as much printing as I did when I first got it. So that's when it was a lot of fun. Uh, that and the fact that it smells like crap. And my wife is very sensitive to it. Well, that's because you gotta go from the battle tech to printing real miniatures, like <laughs> something that's bigger. Yeah. <laughs> that's bigger than you know <laughs> those tiny yeah, yeah. ass battle tech minis, which are fine. And people love battle tech. I get it. I have a few that uh, that you gave me that I'm gonna try painting up here shortly. But you gotta you gotta go for the 32, something a 32 or bigger, man. I print do. I printed out. I printed out some space heroes and <laughs> nuns with guns <laughs> and um, some ships. <laughs> some ships <laughs> yeah so uh yeah there's uh, it's it's amazing the kind of stuff you can find out there it's scary too <laughs> there's some very scary stuff that i probably wouldn't want to print with a resin printer and actually use it actually i probably wouldn't use it if i was printing it with anything um but um might be pretty funny uh elephant Gifts for Christmas. <laughs> if I want, if I don't want to keep my job, <laughs> hey, I'll get fired in two easy steps by doing it. Uh, yeah, fourteen-hour yeah. print with this. Uh, <laughs> what is that? Yeah, page that that you cults, whatever it called, three D cults or whatever it is. Three D yeah, cults. Go. Yeah, has the adult section, <laughs> and you can just let your imagination go, or you can just go straight there and take a look if you want to. Um, it's like a freaking it's kind train of disturbing. Wreck. It's disturbing, and it's like a train wreck. You're like, what the yeah, hell is this stuff? And it's like, what made you think of that? I would have never thought in a million years that you would do that and that with a 3D model, but yeah, somebody wants one. <laughs> like, I don't. Um, I, I'm not sure resin is supposed to go inside your body at any point. So, <laughs> or exactly. Well, you know, it's not just three. It's not just resin printing. You can print with. Um, the, what is it, the FDL or FPL or whatever that is. Oh, is that the filament stuff? That's the, the filaments. Fil yeah. And then um, if you do a good enough copy, then you can make a mold out of it, and then you could make things out of rubber or <laughs> pleather or right. nylon, <laughs> anyway, silicone, so what's on my things, <laughs> real flesh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Like no, it. not real flesh. Like <laughs> you can like shave it off and like stick it. No, you got to cut that whole thing out, man. It's not cool. <laughs> no, yeah, I think that's going away. This podcast took a <laughs> took a weird turn. Um, although it is pretty. That's fun. that's uh, that's listening to paint dry after hours. After with, hours right? <laughs> with Mike and Dan and Stumpy <laughs> and the dildo barber has arrived. <laughs> yes, he's here. We're going to, tonight on uh, listening to Paint Try After Hours. The Dildo Barber paints foreskins. <laughs> Painting foreskins. And there was something else. Oh, what was it? 
rodent hair ass <laughs> rodent ass hair rodent and, and missile yeah. memory missile memory that's right missile memory <laughs> So yeah, we have like totally forgot about brushes. <laughs> well, was, well, that was we we, we did we did the brushes. Now we're on our desk stuff. So, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, we kind of wondered. So let's see, is that all I'm doing? Yeah, I cleaned my desk off a couple times now. I have been airbrushing a lot lately, as I said before. So that's been kind of fun. Um, and hey. I totally forgot what you're working on. No, 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 no. Let's not let, let let's let's stay right there again because. Uh oh. You're Mr. Butterfingers, apparently. Last episode, you dropped an airbrush. In oh, between, yeah. In between that episode and recording this airbrush episode, you dropped another airbrush. I right? dropped another one. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ken from Badger, I might be sending you some airbrushes since I broke the crap out of them. <laughs> <laughs> test, yeah. Test so, I, I dropped my, um, my my 105 one of my 105s and my chrome renegade renegade i dropped both of those and just yeah so <laughs> yeah i was having a bad day yeah i can imagine a bad week i can imagine <laughs> and then, and that sucks yeah. and then today uh, i did something with my lawnmower and yeah ugh. Oh. Go buy a new one of those. <laughs> Freaking hate lawnmowers. Airbrush, lawnmowers, new cars, respirators. Right. Well, you know, it's that's the way it seems. Everything in the house goes at one time, right? So yeah. we're starting to get a line on the big screen TV, which means one of the LCD connectors is loose. My oh, wife, that sucks. <laughs> my wife opened the dishwasher thinking she was She-Ra and ripped something out of it. So I got to I figured out that. <laughs> like, what the hell are you doing? And then... Yeah. The stove, the display on the stove is going crazy. Like, oh my god, like oh, it's like gosh. flashing, and then nobody in my house can figure out the roll-up blinds or the closet doors. And so, somebody, if nobody stands in front of a blind and tries to open it, they try to open it at some weird angle, and so they inevitably pull it off the hinge, it unravels, and then it doesn't work again. So not a single damn blind in our house will actually roll back up. And then, you know, the closet doors are an easy concept, cold to open. But my family's like, okay, so we lift and then pull, which literally takes the door off the hinge every time they rip it open. The door. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, you know, the home, homeowner problems. Anyway, so I, I feel your pain. It was just, and that was like, you know, like yeah. a, in a one week period of time, all the, this yeah, I did. starts happening. It was two, yeah, two airbrushes I killed. And um, in a one week period. So, yeah, my SOTAR is the only one that really, really works right now. So I'm being extra careful with it because I break that one. I don't know what I'm going to do. So it's, I guess, buy another airbrush. Um, so if anybody has any recommendations for airbrushes. Yeah, you can hit us up at listening to paint dry at gmail.com. We'd love to hear what you're using. Absolutely. Yeah. But, yeah and my desk, yeah. my desk hasn't really changed, man. And since the last time we talked, uh, I'm still prepping forward, uh, looking at the, the Golden the, Demon. The, yeah, right. <laughs> well, it could be Golden Demon 2021, right? You know, I, I do have a couple ideas if, if we do venture out to a Decathlon next year. Um, you but, know, uh, it's just going to be a drunken, f- <laughs> it's going to be a <laughs> drunken fest next year. Oh, we have to crazy. try to get out there, man. Yeah, that's no, going to be awesome. That that uh, I. I I want to try another con too. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I love, I love the Nova Open, but I really would like to try to get to Reaper Con or, or something else too. Ah, uh, but you know, next year, man, Nova's going to be moving to a new location. I, I, be pretty I, awesome. I know the location is going to be awesome, but you know, my my big beef with the Nova is that I don't feel like they offer enough classes. Um, and they didn't change that this year. You know, they didn't really offer a ton more classes, and I feel like actually the areas of the classes that I would be interested decrease. You know, Roman's coming. That's Roman Plot's coming back and that's fantastic. I wish I could have taken his three day pre con course, but that's just not my budget right now. I am taking an OSL course with him, so I'm totally excited about that. But I, I mean Yeah, I, that's pretty cool. There's I, some really neat ones. There are some, there are a few neat classes out there, but you know, they go so fast, space is so limited. And a lot of these classes, if you look they're offered one time and that's it. 
And so, like, there's nobody's, repeat, you know, there's not a lot of repeat classes, you know, and so it kind of is frustrating. I don't know, you know, I took a couple of classes with, with Duncan last year. I'm wondering if I should take a, you know, Duncan Rhodes from Games Workshop, but he's no longer oh, with shit. them. You know what? I forgot to take a class with Peachy. Yeah, I think I'm going to go. We should try to find a class together to take with Peachy like we did with Duncan this year. Maybe we can get well, you know, to talk about shower chicken wings. Yeah, something like that. You know, I think uh, part of why there's not a repetitive set of classes is uh, we've got an awful lot of like really talented instructors that have been coming in, and I think they just don't have enough space and time to allow all those instructors to do all that painting. Yeah, so, well, they only have four classrooms. But. Yeah, no. Well, you know, this is all going to change again next year. We'll, we could probably triple, quadruple, depending on, you know, how the facilities are and everything. But, you know, it's going to be pretty freaking cool, I think. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm torn about it. I just, I, you know. No, I'm, I'm right there with you. Because it does suck. So if you want to take an OSL class from somebody and it's only offered one time and you have, you know, another class that you want to take, but that's the only time you can take it. That's a bummer. I, I totally get that. At least twice. At least have two of the classes. Um, you know, well, yeah, I'm, right. You know. Yeah, all the, the advanced airbrushing classes are like, there was one of them, and it was at the same time as Roman's OSL class. You know, and you're like, all right, well, great. <laughs> That's it. I guess, I guess I know which one I'm choosing. And so, but and, and I guess what the, my other issue was is that there were multiple really expensive not hands-on painting multi-hour courses and i was just kind of like I, I get that talking listening to an instructor is awesome but i don't learn that way i have i, I learned hands-on trying something getting a critique right there i can't i don't do as well taking notes and going home and practicing you know what i mean i do better yeah. when i when i get hands-on experience and that was a neat feature that they offered this year is one on one, you know, some private, semi private lessons. That's, that's great. But again, you know, I know the, I know the purpose is a charitable donation, et cetera, but those prices were really steep too. I mean, for a semi private lesson for half a day was over half the cost of Roman's three day workshop. True. That and, is true. And so it just, all that stuff priced itself right out of my ballpark this year. And, it, it, it was a bummer. I still, you know, I'm still taking classes. I'm still looking at, uh, I got to look at the class core because as of right now, I won't be there on Thursday. I, I don't have any reason to be at the convention on Thursday mm -hmm. of it because I'm not taking a class or anything. So, and I'll be there Wednesday night for the games. I got into the games workshop preview event. Yeah. You know, I totally forgot about that and I didn't get in. So I'll just, I'll find a way in somehow. Right, so, <laughs> beg, borrow, steal, bribe, um, offer peachy chicken wings. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll get in. Um, but you know, um, so anyways, but you know, one thing we didn't point out yet, Dan, is that it, this episode we have an interview with Jason Craze from Slowfuse Gaming, who partners with Creaturecaster, and that's where the store is, and. Uh, he, it's an excellent interview. We get to talk a lot about how brushes are made because they offer a line of brushes and a line of paints as well. And so it's kind of neat to hear that process and how, how they go about actually, you know, the kind of the brush design from start to finish to, to finish product and how it evolved and et cetera. So um, it's a very educational interview. Cool. I can't wait to hear it. Jason from Slow Fuse Gaming, welcome to the show. Hey, Mike, thanks for having me. Good to be yeah. here. It's it's great it's great to have you. We're excited about talking to someone who's both in the hobby and also a uh, kind of entrepreneur in the hobby as well. It's kind of a different route uh, from a lot of the artists that we talk to. Um, so tell me, how did you get started out in this crazy hobby we have? Oh gosh, painting little mans. Um, yeah. So it probably started when I was about eleven. Well, it, it started earlier than that. I've been building models uh, with my dad since I can remember um, and then discovered through Dungeons and Dragons in probably 81, 82 ish, something like that. Very early 80s. Um, a uh, kid in our neighborhood who was older 
uh, was looking to do it and didn't have anybody to play with except for the other kids in the neighborhood. So he kind of taught us all this crazy thing called Dungeons and Dragons. And, and in amongst that, he had these, you know, uh, old Ral Partha and uh, probably some Citadel miniatures in there at some point in time. And I just got enthralled with the little dudes on the table. That was to me, that was better than the game. Right. Because it, was, it took me to my hey, I paint models. And uh, so I started painting the miniatures for the local group for all of our characters. And um, then it's just that's history right now. It's been nearly 40 years of, of doing this. So pretty crazy. Wow. OK, that, that's uh, that's impressive. I know a lot of people take a hiatus. Did you take any break whatsoever or do you just keep plowing straight through? Oh, yeah. No, there's been tons of breaks. <laughs> you know, <laughs> do things like discover girls that that uh, when you're young and you're you're uh, finding your way. You uh, you don't get the opportunity to. Well, at least back then, I was not like flying my nerd flag very high. <laughs> you know, I played uh, I played sports, uh, skateboarded. It was into punk rock. There's been so many of those detours in life uh, away from the hobby, but they've always come back to it. Um, and a lot of it is just for me, at least, has been more of a matter of are the other things that I'm doing in my life uh, allowing for that time to actually have a sit down hobby? Um, you know, a lot of times the, like in sports, your, your hobby doesn't get to necessarily be there with you as you're playing games and practicing and all of that. So, and if you're tired and going to bed early, then it doesn't leave you a lot of time, but, uh, you know, it's, it's funny because the hobby itself has always been a lure to me. It, even when I wasn't doing it, I was kind of jonesing for it, you know, it, it mm -hmm. in the back of your head, you're, you're probably having dreams about, you know, painting little men and, and mm -hmm. playing games and stuff. It's a weird haunting feeling. So, yeah, you always you always come back. It's only been, though, and since my probably um, late 20s, early 30s, that it's been more of a of a nonstop thing. So oh, nice. So you decided to create Slow Fuse Gaming. Um, can you give us a little bit of a history of the company? Oh, sure. Uh, well, you know, it's funny because it started as a um, a function of streaming um, because we started uh, nearly a decade ago now streaming in the video game space and j again just as another fun hobby and uh, that you know developed into eventually streaming painting miniatures and tutorials and all the things that came out of that and then it was just a progression in to actually making products you know it's a it's a weird leap I always have a, a I guess a I want to create things. Um, and so whatever it is that I'm doing, I'm always looking at ways to, you know, if there's a, a hole in, uh, you know, the process of whatever it is I'm doing, whether it's welding or, uh, you know, building a, uh, a car or a motorcycle, I've done all these things. And in the midst of that, I'll find a tool that doesn't work quite the way I want it to. And so I'll make my own. Um, and, uh, you know, I, especially coming up through metalworking and, and that end of, of, uh, it wasn't always a business, but it was a hobby for me as well that you just kind of make do right. Sometimes you don't either have the uh, the know how or the in most cases, you just don't have the tool, the proper tool to get the job done. Right. And so you just build it and or you or you build something that approximates the, the right <laughs> thing to get the job done. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean that a professional wouldn't show up and say, what in the world have you done? You know, well, it got the job done. That's kind of my life. And uh so in model painting, it just became the same thing because throughout my entire careers, I guess the bad grammar there, but through all of the different things that I've done, manufacturing has always been in the very close proximity. Okay. Um, so whether it was me actually manufacturing things or working for businesses where I was in my job thrust me squarely into the manufacturing process, whether it was design or production uh, or even sales uh, management. You know, having to look at how products are made, you build a, 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 I guess, a good rapport if you're if you're paying attention and want to with the people that get all those levels of tasks done. And so I just brought that into the hobby, right? I, you know, call up a guy and say, "Hey, do you have any idea how to make a paintbrush?" <laughs> you know? And then you go from there. So that's actually a great segue for this because I, I was curious as to what prompt it, like what kind of was lacking for paint brushes and paints out there that prompted you to move in that direction to to creating those type of lines wow um this one's one that i always try to tread carefully because the the 
however you the fine art community will get very angry sometimes <laughs> uh, and I don't mean angry like throw rocks at you but you know it's a it, it can be a touchy subject right because paintbrushes aren't made for us as hobbyists right. um, and and that's just a fact of that business and how the process of making paintbrushes and and you have to kind of back up and think in terms of every product that is made is made with a goal in mind, a use case in mind. And some have multiple use cases. In the case of paintbrushes, a paintbrush is made to put paint on a surface. And then you can say, well, gosh, there's a lot of surfaces. And the answer is, right. yes, you're correct. <laughs> and and, <laughs> and a lot of those, there's a paintbrush that will fit a lot of, like if you go buy a paintbrush to paint your house, it's much different than a paintbrush to paint on canvas because it needs to hold thicker paint. It needs to cover a broader surface as you take a brush stroke. Um, and so can you leverage different um, tools between you know different use cases? And the answer there is yes too, but I wouldn't try to paint a miniature with a house paint brush. Um, and in a lot of cases, it feels like that sometimes when buying artist brushes, because they're made for painting, in most cases, painting flat surfaces like canvases and things like that. Um, and so in, in our hobby, we've kind of gravitated over the years towards sable brushes because the sable brush is built towards uh, both drawing and releasing a thinner type of paint than all the other brushes, right? Most brushes are built around oils or paste acrylics and things that have, uh, you know, a much higher viscosity and, and thickness to them, more like, uh, you know, painting with, uh, you know, mustard or right. <laughs> than, than painting with water like we do. And so um, uh, break out the paint. old tempura paints, right? Yeah, From right. Elementary school. <laughs> yeah, well, and even in the early days of me and hobbying, and I know for a lot of us uh, that have been doing this for a long time, like enamels, like the old thick testers enamels, right? You glom them on your model and, and half the detail would go away. But well, I guess that's not true because the models back then didn't have a ton of detail. Um, you know, but we had to be very careful and my mom always hated it because I'd have to use like mineral spirits to thin these paints. And so the whole house smelled in order right. to, for me to do my job, what job to have fun, right? It wasn't a have job fun. when I was, you know, 10 years old, <laughs> but, um, right. and I wasn't good when I was 10 years old either. <laughs> so it was, uh, I was probably making a mess with all these smelly paints that were thick and ruining brushes because you don't know how to clean them. And as a kid, you can't be bothered. And so nothing ever worked right. And just a hassle. But as I started really looking at it and saying, hey, you know, if I were because I, I, I'm crazy, I sit around and ask myself, if I were going to make, you know, a new car, what would I want my car to be like? And, you know, I'll sit in back of napkin things. Um, and so for paintbrushes, my my thought was that I really didn't like uh, large, uh, we call them large bellied brushes. They look like a like a candle flame. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, at the ferrule, they, they pinch to the diameter of the ferrule, whatever the, the size you're using is. And then they tend to kind of flare out in the middle of the belly and then combine back to a good point. Um, and these brushes are really neat for canvas painting because they can achieve a, a tremendous range of line thickness as you paint because the belly allow the thick belly allows a brush to spread a lot further and you can then have control from a very fine line of paint if you have a very tight point on it to then pressing very hard on the brush gives you a very thick uh, line of paint. And so you can imagine as you're painting different things on a canvas and they go in very different scales that you can achieve a lot of different techniques with one brush. For us in the in the miniature hobby, we're painting three dimensional sculptures and and as an individual painter, that fat belly always got in the way of me using the same brush all the time because the dimension around the barrel would be um, too large if you're using like a number three or a number four brush like I do main, mainly. Then, you know, getting it into tight places was a little bit of a, uh, you know, a harder thing for me. When I started doing edge detailing, you would find that because the brush didn't have a straight taper, I'll call it, um, that from the ferrule to the point, it had this curve that doing a, an edge highlight the way I like to paint could give you various thicknesses of line weight coming off of the brush as you pulled that edge detail. Um, and these are minor things. These aren't things that it, most people wouldn't even see them and be like, what is he even talking about? You know, I've been painting with this brush for years and it's great, but I'm a nutcase. And so I said, well, I'm going to try to make a brush with a straighter taper that fits the way I like to paint. And if I, and I, and I said, okay, what does this take? And it took making hundreds of them, nearly thousands of them to just get started wow. with any reputable manufacturer. And I was like, oh, well, then I got to sell them. 
Because <laughs> if I want the brush I want to paint with, I have to find other people that want that same brush. And uh, so it, it, manufacturing is kind of a selfish thing at some point, right? Because as you create a product, you're really, in some cases at least, creating it for you because you see a need and a problem that you want to solve. Um, obviously, that's not true of everything. Sometimes you're building something to solve the world's problems. Um, I don't believe that paintbrushes were the world's problems, um, but I wanted a, I wanted a different kind of paintbrush for myself. And so I made it uh, through the stream. Um, and this is kind of a unique situation because the the stream on Twitch and our crowd and our following allowed us a very unique opportunity that most companies have to pay an arm and a leg for, which is a captured audience that is um, kind of uh, tied into your personal benefit. And by that, I mean. They're very supportive. They like what you do and want you to be around longer to do it more. And so in that kind of symbiotic relationship, because I need you to watch what I do in order to keep doing it. And if, as long as I do that and you like it, you know, you'll keep watching. Um, I was able to get people to test the brushes and try the brushes. And uh, and we got ridiculously good feedback from them. Some, you know, we, we ran into some manufacturing issues along the way. Um, but overall, people were very happy with what I was doing. And so that launched it. It was it was really and and that's a long rambling way of getting back to it, it was really that easy. <laughs> you know, I said, <laughs> I want to do this. I know people in manufacturing because I've been in manufacturing for motorcycle parts and electronics for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so I just made phone calls and I said, hey, this is a crazy conversation. Actually, one of my buddies in electronics manufacturing has a side business that makes electronic toys. And so I called him in Taiwan. And I said, do you happen to know anybody that makes art supplies? And he turned me on to a buddy in Japan and that buddy turned me on. Well, that's where the first brushes came from. Our first sable brushes uh, came in a partnership with a company in Japan. Um, and then we learned very quickly that their version of brushes, they weren't really making fine art brushes. Um, but he, through that relationship, I grew and met, you know, master brush makers in Germany and throughout Europe and was able to then start having conversations about where to really take this. And by then, our volumes for sales were growing enough that I could say, OK, I, I can really bring real business to the table now. It's not, hey, how can I make 100 brushes? Um, you know, it's how can I make right. 100,000 brushes? And now more people will, of course, listen to you because of the economics of scale. So. No, that's all. I mean, that's awesome that it works out that way. Um, kind of answered it a bit, but uh, I, I'm curious as to uh, as far as like the synthetic syn blah excuse me the synthetic side of it goes as well is that um you have the igniters which are the sables and then you have uh two different lines that's in synthetic so um what was there a difference in the creation of those two was one more difficult than the other to create or to develop the hardest one was the sables because manufacturers don't well i guess they have all been a little bit of an uphill climb because most manufacturers factories that is don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time changing what they do mm -hmm. um and so we got very lucky because it's only through the relationships at the individual level that we were able to say hey would you be willing to do x um and have people not laugh in our face um so as far as synthetic synthetic i think is a little bit easier to start with we have you mentioned the igniters that's our sables the the uh, artillery was the first um, synthetic that we did. And, and way back when it was called the utility brushes. And we made those as a way for people to have a cost effective alternative to sables that still got a lot of that job done. So that if you had a, um, like a more forceful painting hand, I, I call it a heavy hand. If you're heavy handed, then you're kept beating up brushes that this was a, a cost effective way for you to get the job done and not feel like you were blowing 20 bucks a day, you know, as you were right. painting your models. Some everybody paints differently and it's not right or wrong, but there are brushes that fit your particular needs better or worse. Um, and also things like dry brushes where we know going in that we're the goal is to beat this brush up. Um, right. <laughs> and so there's, right. there's, there's just certain things like to make a, uh, you know, what in the art world would be called a flat shader out of sable is definitely doable, but it's not the best way and not the best brush for that technique. So we would say, OK, and, and most everybody would agree there. You go to like camel hair or something a little stiffer um, and synthetic is right up the 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 way for that, because the cost can be kept low for these things that as hobbyists, we we typically are treating as disposable. 
And, and so that's where that came from. Those were pretty easy. Um, we played around with handle size. I get to go through and be in that unique situation where I can say, you know, get feedback from people. And we started with longer handles. We shortened the handle up a bit and, and got a lot better response. So other than that, I, I think that they were kind of all the same. Um, the most difficult one that we've done is the debt cords, which are, are they're a pure synthetic brush, but they're made to respond to liquid acrylic like a sable. So they draw paint off the palette and release paint off the brush onto the model in the same way that a sable would, or as close to it as you can come with a non-natural bristle. Um, there's a lot of, of uh, I, I tried to call it technical issues, but animal hair has natural oils and skinning on the hair that causes it to uh, have the, um, the ability to draw paint. Um, and that capillary action is a little bit different than man-made. Uh, bristles. And so the toughest one was working with companies to find a bristle that wasn't actually being used in the art world at the time. It was being used to make very strong backpacking goods that were very flexible, lightweight and flexible uh, uh, polyester nylon combinations. Uh, but they got one that when you put it into bristles and made it into a hair for a brush worked like a sable. And so we were able to kind of benefit from that and work with one of our manufacturers uh, with them taking most of the load because they saw that this could be a really neat market segment and uh, and developed a brush. And uh, that's been our deck cord. It's consistently one of our best sellers. I use them all the time when I paint. I'm, you know, it's funny because I am probably about a 90% synthetic painter. I, mm -hmm. I use synthetics all the time, but I have a very light, delicate touch with my painting. So it, basically if the brush is the right size, it'll work for me. So. So then I guess with that kind of along that same line, then one of the things I've noticed with that I struggle with with synthetic brushes is that anything under like a size five or six, five or six tip curls curl. like halfway through, <laughs> yeah, it gets a tip curl halfway through the I'm using it. Um, are is the jack court designed to kind of because it's the sable, um, is, uh, the sable synthetic i guess or a sabral hybrid whatever however you want to call it i apologize well uh, they're they're a fake we, synthetic uh they're not because they there are hybrid brushes we've been playing around with a blend they're, they're called blends and it would be a half synthetic half sable blend um and and those can be really good too the the reality comes down to you're dealing with plastic right so the bristles are plastic there are various forms of plastic right. nylon being at the very low end um which you'll see bending with I won't say instantaneously, but from your first couple of uses, you'll start seeing the brush reshape itself um, up into very, very expensive uh, polyester blends and, and things like that. But they're all still purely man-made synthetics um, because of their if we lump it into one term called plastic, you know, you'll notice if you bend plastic, it gets what we call a memory um, and it will always want to bend to that shape various durometers and 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 scales of of plastic uh hardness will allow it to deflect more or less and, and by deflect mean bend and and retain its shape and sometimes you want plastic to bend and retain the shape you bend it to most times for us we don't right we'd love to have it be straight all the time it just doesn't happen that way um with uh we teach people when using synthetics that you can uh if you uh, I, I dread to say every brush stroke, but as you're brushing on the paint, a lot of people unknowingly always hold the brush in the same orientation. And for some people, it's funny if you watch, they'll hold it to where the uh, the lettering on the brush always faces up in their hand. So imagine holding a number two pencil where you always saw the number two part. And it's kind of a subconscious thing that some people will do. They'll pick it up and rotate it in their hand immediately so that there's some visual cue and then they'll start painting. So, of course, if you hold a brush in the same way or close to the same way all the time and paint in the same direction all the time, uh, what you, because we all kind of pull paint rather than push paint mostly. Um, and if you're pulling in the same direction, then you'll start to form that that curvature at the tip, regardless of how your hand pressure is. And the brush remembers that, right? Those They start to bend, they bend more, they bend more, they bend more. Eventually, you get to a point where the bristles themselves don't seem to bend over anymore because they've now matched your natural brush stroke direction. Um, and so unless you decide to paint harder with them, they're always going to be that way. Um, and when you look at the brush, it tends to make you think this brush is bad. And when in reality, a lot of times it won't have that delicate point that you're wanting, but the brush itself is is almost shaped for your hand now. 
and this is right. going to okay, infuriate some people when I say this, <laughs> because it's not a function. It's not something we go into when we build a synthetic brush and say, ooh, this one, you know, remembers your brush stroke perfectly. And that's a great thing. But for a lot of people, I'll talk to them. And as artists, they'll be like, well, I never pay attention to that because, you know, I just paint with it and it, you know, it it knows the direction and it still flows paint off it like it should. Obviously, at some point where it loses its tip, you aren't getting the delicate line consistency that you really want out of it. You can't paint the eyeball anymore. Um, but imagine if you now re rotate that brush a little bit. So I kind of uh, people always are talking on stream because they'll see it and they'll bring it to my attention. I paint and after a couple of strokes, I rotate the brush 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. And every time I go to the palette, I rotate the brush 90 degrees again yeah. and you'll start to see the tip uh, kind of go with your brush stroke and then just rotate it around and go against it. Um, and you'll maintain a, a more unified tip for longer. But you can't ever avoid uh, a synthetic brush, uh, you know, bending and losing its point like that. That's just part of the, the deal. And again, that goes back to what I said initially of brushes aren't made for us. Um, as we paint three dimensional surfaces, we see a lot more stress on a brush tip than other like just painting a flat canvas um, right. unless you're just banging the brush on your flat canvas all the time. And so, uh, you know, we, we're going to see the kind of disposable nature of brushes raise its ugly head a lot more often for us. You know, imagine dragging your sable brush across a sharp metal uh, infinity model edge to edge detail it. You would never do that with your head hair. You know, you, right. you don't take your hair out <laughs> and drag it on the corner of the counter in order to, uh, uh, you know, breathe life back into it. So we're, we beat our brushes up as, as the base. Component. Right. I'm just, I'm sitting here thinking of all the Stormcast Eternals I'm painting that are all spiked and armored, and I'm like, yeah, that'll kill a brush. That'll kill a brush in a in a heartbeat. You, you know, we need pickets out on the line and say, GW kills brushes. No, right. <laughs> <laughs> Bottles kill Insane. brushes, right? But it's it's just a any kind of 3D surface um, is like that. And well, I say that not any. Obviously, you can find like painting a spear, like a ball, isn't going to hurt your brush. But for us, yeah, we've got the spiky bits and all of the inside corners and, uh, you know, rough edges that we're painting that are details on the model. They're not imperfections. And so we are ultimately degrading the lifespan of our brush as just by virtue of what we do. Um, you know, because when I talk to people and I, I paint canvas as well, uh, and when I speak to artists that strictly paint canvas, you'd be surprised at how little they care about their brushes. Right. Mm -hmm. What they care about is the type of brush, the size of brush that they've been using. They like the handle. They like the shape. Right. And that's what they use. And they use it. They paint and they toss it in the garbage and they buy 10 more of the same brush. And it depends on their level of art and where it sits in their lifestyle as to how much they pay, which is just the way we do it. It's a weird kind of thing in the hobby world that there's a there's like a um, what do we want to call this? There's an attachment at a different level to our brushes, right? right. Um, right. And, and I, I've never really been able to put my thumb on it. I think it's great. You know, we all say, what's your, you know, I get asked all the time, what's my favorite brush? And I'll be like, I have a cup of 90 of them. You know, I, this one that I'm using right now is my favorite brush. Right. Um, but a lot of people really have that. You know, you'll look and, and as, now that we've become a brush manufacturer, um, we see it a lot more. You know, because people will be like, oh, you know, the, you know, I, I tried the deck cords and the tip curled and, you know, I'll never buy another one. And they're very adamant about it. And I love that. I love the 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 passion that people have for their tools. But it, it's weird for me coming from a world where you know, it's a tool and I want my tool to get the job done. And so we build it to get the job done. And much like a grinding disc, it got the job done. It worked well. But my expectation was that it's eventually going in the trash and I'm buying another grinding disc. So. Right. I know. And, you know, I'm I'm one of those people that gets attached to brushes. And, you know, I I kind of my I have kind of five brushes that go on my desk when I start to do detail work and we're over those out. And the the one the zero and the one from the igniter line are two of those five brushes. And so awesome. uh, I, I appreciate you uh, all the effort you put into creating those brushes because I, I, I that's. And I, they they take some damage too because I've been working them. I've had I've had uh, I've had them for about a year now, and they're That's awesome. they're so they're they're holding up nicely. I wound up buying the rest of the set uh, except for the four which just came out. So I got to take yeah, a look. Yeah, we, we just altered that set and got rid of the double zero, I think, out of it because it's just yeah, I don't pay able to be effective really. 
Yeah, and I don't really paint with any. Like you, I would say most of the 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 zero is my black liner, and the rest of it's you know I use one and up for all the different brushes. But so also the brush education is awesome. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm kind of curious if we can talk some about the paint line too, because the uh, the this is kind of the, I, I'm curious as to development how you develop the paint line, what kind of caused you to go in the route of painting. I know it's kind of the same question, but. You know, I, I can listen to this type it's of stuff for hours. It's another Games Workshop model. <laughs> I blame it on another Games Workshop. It was a Forge World model. It was, I, this is a funny story. We tell it on stream all the time, you know, because everybody asks, what made you decide to make your own paint line? And it's a it's a, a tremendous, great question. We love talking about it. Um, but I was painting Eidolon, the first captain of the Emperor's Children from the 30K line of Forge World, Right. Um, I was doing a commission for one of our viewers on stream and he had a bunch of the 30 K emperor's children that he had had me paint. And I had done Fulgrim and a bunch of terminators, Phoenix terminators. And I forget what all of the jump pack guys are called. Um, had done them all on stream and we were doing Eidolon as a character when he came out and his cloak is this nice sculpted, you know, not really billowy, but a neat cloak and it's white. And so we got the airbrush out and, uh, you know, we based it the way I do and, and went in. And at the time I was using mostly Vallejo model air and um, uh, game color paints, some army painter paints in there, too. You know, the studio was a amalgam like everybody's is of tons of different brands of paint. Whatever the color that I enjoyed was what I was picking up. And it was less about manufacture. And so we right. put that white on there and whites suck. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Hobby white liquid acrylic whites are very, very difficult to manufacture well without spending a lot of money on the raw materials. Um, it's much easier to bleach a pigment to get white pigment than to buy a pigment that is more naturally white and needs less processing to keep white like titanium white. Um, and uh, so it, it was funny that we're painting with this white and it was just giving me fits and I and you know we never saw it and it's still to this day the only thing I've ever stripped and repainted on stream I got so frustrated this, my viewers are laughing at me we're having a good time with it it wasn't a bad thing but I was just like hooting and hollering I was like oh my gosh this is going to make me make my own white paint and it did <laughs> and so then not a couple of weeks later we made white paint and uh, called it special white. I took some uh, very high end titanium white uh, and then I mixed my own witch's brew of, of mediums uh, behind it to give it a liquid base, reduce the viscosity of it so that it would flow better for what we do in our painting and uh, started using that on stream. And uh, and people immediately were like, I need some of that. And I was like, would you buy this? You know, and it was very early on, like we had barely made brushes at this point. And so mm -hmm. we weren't really jen and i didn't know if we were ready to tackle manufacturing as a big thing right it was it was still like well this is a little thing and really it's the stream and the relationship building and the community with the the stream viewers and the tutorials we do that was the big thing and that was still a driving it was still our revenue source and and all that's really what the company was and in the midst of it we sold some brushes we sold stickers we made these things and little you know kind of uh uh what would you call them knickknacks <laughs> really we weren't we were right. about it. and so uh yeah so after we made that white we called it special white we hand mixed it here at home uh i worked with uh two different manufacturers on the actual uh pigment at that point we finally got it built the way we wanted to it was performing very well and um at the end of the day people started buying more than we could make so we had to uh we had to make a decision on whether or not we were going to continue um, and and broaden our range and manufacturing capability to make uh, bigger batches, or if we were just going to say, well, you know, that was fun while it lasted. And uh, and, li and literally, that's the story that got us to what well, you can see, which direction we chose. Right. We, right. <laughs> like, like I said earlier, I just said, OK, if I was going to make, you know, paints, what would I need my paints to be like? Because I made the white that I like and everybody else sees it and uses it and. We'd put it in these, you know, little bottles, dropper bottles and hand write 
special white on the side of it with a heart in on it and you'd get it with sharpie on the side and a bottle and there's still a bunch of people out there that have their sharpie bottles with a little bit of paint that they're holding on to <laughs> and uh and i said well we need it to act like this but we need it to be made not you know in a bucket in our garage you know we need to do the things that would take it to the next level of of being a real uh professional paint that i could hand off to somebody who didn't paint miniatures and say hey you know, you use liquid acrylics in your life. How about this? And have them come back and say, that's the best damn liquid acrylic I've ever used. And so we, you know, we looked at all sorts of products out there. Obviously, I'd been using the the products in the miniature and hobby world for decades. So I felt fairly comfortable with all of that. Uh, the lion's share, those are all made in the same factory or factories. Uh, there's really only two factories over in Europe that, that focus a lot on this. And um you know, so we I immediately started contacting all these people. I said, hey, you know, where does Vallejo make their paint? Let's talk to them, you know, uh, and get them on the phone and see, you know, how much does it cost to have you make this great paint? I have an idea for and um, immediately got shut down. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Everybody wanted to deal with us, but we didn't want to we, we couldn't afford to jump into the game at that level. Right. Because you're talking half a million dollars uh, U.S. in order to just start the gears turning. It's huge. And right. uh, and I had no idea. I was just ignorant to it. You know, more, most of the manufacturing we had done was like, OK, you know, we can we can take the profits from this month and move it into this product next month and, you know, make that money. And then the next month, make a new product. And this one was like, oh, geez, we need like an investor. We need a banker, <laughs> you know, and that wasn't going to happen. So uh, we just kept towing it. I think it was probably about a year and a half of maybe not quite that long. I know it was over a year of us going back and forth with different manufacturers. I went all over the world. I talked to uh, again. I went back to my uh, contact in Japan um, and that was looking that was looking very, very good. Um, and the paints we went through about three iterations of the paints. We did all this live on stream. I would get new paints to test and we'd paint a model on stream and, uh, you know, pe- get feedback. We'd see some really horrible things. We'd see some really great things. And so it was a really fun, iterative process. And then at the end of the day, we just decided, you know what, we just want to make this here. We want to have this be a North American product as much as you can. Some pigments don't are sourced worldwide, but the bulk of the medium and everything we wanted to do in North America. And so we we found a a partner who had the chemistry side of it down, and then we just started knocking it around and and going from scratch rather than using somebody else's because all the other factories they want to sell you what they already have, and you can adjust a little bit. You can make your own pigment mixes to get your own colors, um, but generally the medium base that they use is kind of a known quantity to them, and they want to use what they're familiar with that their machines are tuned for, and so you couldn't really get in and do the things we wanted to do to make a new paint at the volumes we were talking, right? Uh, right. Vallejo and an army painter can make alterations because they are bigger uh, uh, than we are currently. So we just backed up and said, okay, well, if we're gonna do it, let's do it right. Let's not skimp and make the paint that we're not happy with. And we just waited and and that's where uh, that's where ProCro wound up coming in. And we're very happy we waited and put the time into it because I think we hit it out of the park. Yeah, so far so good. I've, I've enjoyed using the colors that that, that I have. Um, so talk to me about the the bottle tip though. It's a, a much different bottle tip than the dropper <laughs> or the pot. And so how did that come about? So this tip is the same tip in tattoo inks. Um, okay. Uh, I think Golden Liquid Acrylics uses a, a similar cap. Uh, obviously, like you know, various um, adhesives use a similar cap. Um, you know, glues like Elmer's glue uses kind of this twist top. Thing. It's been a cap that we've all had in our lives in it, it, it some way, you know, soap bottles, all <laughs> sorts of things use it. And um, the team kind of came back and said, hey, we really like this bottle. Um, and uh, because a couple of the guys at uh, actually at Creature Caster had said, hey, you know, we, we like this kind of cap. And I was like, oh, wow, why? <laughs> you know, I, I like dropper <laughs> bottles. Mm-hmm. and um, they were very adamant about it. They uh, they said, just try it. We're going to send you some and uh, transfer your paints over to them and let us know what you think. And so I did. And uh, I moved the sample paints over into the, the twist cap bottles and started using them. And I won't say immediately, but within a week or two of using them on stream, because we paint a lot around here. And so we put them to the test and I was like, wow, these are really good. You know, mm-hmm. these are really, really neat. They allow me to see 
you know, the, the little bit of dried paint that gets on the tip allows me to see every color exactly how it exists on the dried model as opposed to through the, you know, the translucence of the bottle. Um, I started looking at it from a, a consumer standpoint as best I can and saying, you know, does this solve a problem or does it create a problem? And at the end of the day, I was like, wow, this solves so many of the problems that we have with dropper bottles that we don't recognize because the no matter what the company is, the dropper bottle will uh, off pressure once you put the cap on. And so you'll start building up paint in the cap and eventually it starts drying and expanding to the point to where the tip of the dropper cracks and you start getting all sorts of messy nonsense going on with it. Um, and so I was like, that always really bummed me out because then I had to figure out a way to get the paint out of the bottle still and it became really messy. And so uh, I thought this really solves it. This is this is kind of messier all the time because there's a little bit of paint on the tip of the bottle all the time. But, uh, you know, you drop out a drop on your palette and then wipe, you know, close the cap and then wipe the remainder off on your palette as well. And you get to use it all. And uh, and yeah, it's it's now I don't use anything else. So, and not just because we, you know, we bought a, a bunch of bottles. We've gone through a process now of from the original top to the current top and we've refined it. We went and retooled. Uh, we spent a bunch of money to get the cap retooled to the new bottle size. Um, opened up the vents in it, uh, you know, made it a little bit more robust so that the agitator wouldn't get stuck in it. And we ran into some because we all of our paints come supplied with an agitator. Um, we found some people are, are using bottle shakers that were forcing the agitator up into the neck of the, the uh, nozzle and it was clogging the paint bottle up. So, mm-hmm. you know, how we fixed all that. And I think that through that that feedback we got from the community initially as they learned the bottle top that now we have the, you know, the best product that we can put out on the current ones in bigger bottle, more paint, better cap. It's great. You know, and I always laugh about the, you see on all these forums on Facebook, people complaining about what you got the, you got the dropper bottle versus the paint pot contingent, you know, it's such a battle. And I'm like, they both kind of suck. They both kind of dry paint out, you know, like every, every dropper bottle I have is crusted over the tip of it crusts over at some point, you know, it's not like, uh, yeah. it's got a thing, but so you know, I do enjoy the twist tops on it. It does, it does actually the first thing when I opened one, I went, ah, oh, this is like an Elmer's glue bot, you know, it's kind yeah, of the same glue concept. Is the thing I tell people because they kind of know, even though it's not that same exact thing, it's close. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, and it, it, you know, we chose to seal the bottle. We chose to put an agitator in it. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the soda glass agitator is completely inert, so there's no issues with it. So we've done all the right legwork, I think, to create a kind of encapsulated version of what we consider to be perfect for liquid acrylic paints. And, um, you know, the seal on the bottle will keep it fresh as long as you keep the top closed. It's a positive seal. Um, always make sure you crack the top if you fly with them. A lot of people get, you know, oh, wow, your bottle seal. How'd you find that out? Well, I opened it after I flew and you know, it, it spurt paint all over my thumb, you know, so they do pressurize a little bit. Um, but yeah, we think we've got a really good solution. And obviously we use them pretty much all day, every day. And uh, nice. as as I am, I I want to make the best thing for me. And it goes back to that, you know, it's it's selfish process because I want the tools that if I were stuck on a desert island painting models for the rest of my life and this was all I had, what would I take? And so I'm building the products that are that. They're what we would take to that desert island. And so every time we run into an issue, somebody complains about a feature, is having a problem with a product, we go back and we really dig in and look at it and say, what's causing that? Is that a one-time thing? Was that a batch thing and we've already fixed it? Or is this an ongoing issue that we're going to see? And if it is the latter, we fix it. We, We figure out something and we're not afraid to just kind of throw the whole design away and redesign it like we did with the bottles. Um, you know, if it means that it's going to make a better product and everybody's happy. Nice. So I'm going to use that as a great segue for, for kind of switching into the fun, fun questions of the interview. Desert Island, you can only <laughs> have one model. What, what type of model would it be? Or is there a specific model that you would want to be there stuck painting on a desert Island? Oh, wow. Ah. Uh. So it's another, you know, I, I love them all. Wow, it's so hard. <laughs> like I really do. I, I every model I pick up is a new opportunity to do something cool, and that's what really drives me in the hobby in general. Um, obviously, if I'm doing a particular army, because uh, I do play the games as well, you know. So if I'm trying to finish an army, it's whatever the next model in line is to get the army done. 
you know, I'm doing like four armies right now for four different games. So I'm all over the place. Um, you know, I like, I like bigger characters. So I guess for me, it would be something, you know, like a, like a, a Gilliman or a, or an Abaddon or, you know, one of our creature caster, uh, lords and ladies, you know, something that's in that not super huge category. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't want to paint like one sixteenth human busts. Um, you know, but I like, I like larger scale, lots of detail so that you can really kind of, you know, put some muscle into it and, and get a really amazing product out. But the same is true. It doesn't matter, man. I'll paint anything. <laughs> I love them all. <laughs> Give them all to me. Give me all the mans. So is there a model that, that, that you'd like to see that hasn't been made yet? Oh, wow. Um, that's a great question. That hasn't been made. Oh, I'm sure there's probably tons of stuff I'd like to paint. Um, you know, I came up through sci-fi and fantasy like all of us. I, uh, I'd i really, man, I'd really like some of the, like the, uh, the Bakshi, like wizards, like uh, the assassin mm -hmm. on the two-legged dodo bird looking thing. I just always called him Peace, right? Because his saddle said Peace, but he was the assassin, the red guy. Have you ever seen Wizards? Mm -hmm. I believe so. It's been a while, though. <laughs> it's a crazy Ralph Bakshi animated flick. You know, I'd love to paint him. Uh, you know, there's there's probably through if I if I look through from my childhood, you know, teens and young adult life and fantasy and sci fi and all those weird things we were, you know, coming out of the trippy 70s. There was really crazy character design going on. And I'm sure that I could dig back through like my old War of the Worlds comic books and be like that. I want to paint that, you know. Right. Um, I know that like they did the John Carter movie and the uh, the Princess of Mars series and all that was always really big to me and the you know the uh, the four armed monstrosities that ran around on Mars were always great. I know there's been some some games with miniatures of those. I think some of those done in high detail would be lots of fun just because of the the memorabilia part of it for me. I think. Mm -hmm. you know? I don't know that I bring I back really, to childhood again. I, you know any model, whatever the next cool creature caster release is, give me that. I don't know, yeah, whatever. <laughs> But I think that if we were going for, for something like that, I think the memorabilia from my my 70s and 80s childhood, I could probably dig a dozen really, really cool, in my opinion, things that need to be sculpted ASAP. Nobody else right, probably right. thinks so. but <laughs> Right. See, when somebody asked me that question, the first thing I thought of was the Silverhawks. Then we need Silverhawks from that old 80s cartoon. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, right? Yeah, I just think, you know. that, yeah, see, that would be the greatest stuff. I don't know that I'd really want to paint. Like if I, all of my favorite cartoon stuff came out, I think that because of the way animation worked back then, they'd all be really boring to paint. Right. They'd be like, right. Like, I don't, like it's funny and people are going to hate this. Like I don't really get into the Gundam thing much because big flat surface robots, are they're cool. And I'm and I'm well, I say I'm doing one. I've been doing one for like two years mm -hmm. <laughs> and one of our viewers sent us one. And so I'm turning it into more of a, a scale model project where we're doing a lot of weathering and beating the crap out of it. And, and you know, it'll be a lot of fun. But those aren't the things that I gravitate towards first. Right. Where it's right. big blocky patches of color. And I've seen people do amazing things with them. Just me personally, I look for models that I think wind up having a, a little bit more intricate detailing to them. Yeah, you know, that's actually, it's funny you mentioned that. There's actually a series we're doing on the podcast. is It's called a, a Mini Painter in Headlights, and I'm, I'm actually building a building and preparing a Gundam right now. Yeah. That's what that, and, and it, it is, it's a lot of flat panels, and I've been watching all these YouTube videos and seeing some of the people do these, the scribing with mm -hmm. the chisel, micro chisels. I'm like, all right, no, that's out of my league. I'm not, <laughs> they're See, amazing, and I have, but... the funny thing is I have a bunch of those micro chisels that I use in like scale modeling to do panels and things out of plastic art. And so, you know, it, it's, it would, most people are amazed because they're like, that should be right up your alley doing these. And the build mm -hmm. experience of Gundam is amazing. Like as a model builder, it's like, yes, yeah, these models are ridiculously cool. The quality, the fit and finish. It's like, oh my gosh, Bandai and these companies have just got it down to a science. I love them, you know. But then I find myself, the older I get, I'm like, I don't want to build models. I want to paint. Right. <laughs> so so it's a weird it's a weird push pull for me. You know, I'm like, I don't want to build anymore. I want to paint. Right. Why can't these come <laughs> reassembled? <laughs> yeah, and I, that's, uh, I constantly uh, cuss and complain about mold lines and and 
yeah, nubs and stuff along those lines. Those are bane of my existence. Uh, yeah. So I'm right there with yeah. you. Uh, so now at times, do you feel like you get, besides just in the context of army painting, because I know that's going to be a situation where you kind of get stuck in colors, but is there, do you find yourself gravitating to any certain colors? That's ne- not necessarily of a, like, you know, certain artists, like I know, uh, I, I know an artist that al- pretty much always puts, uh, p3 sanguine base on everything you know that's kind of a main go-to or somebody uses blue liners and stuff along those lines do you find some is there a paint that kind of works its way into most of your models does that make sense of what i'm asking oh yeah yeah no i totally understand and we get asked this probably every stream and uh it yes um i it, this story comes out when people ask me what my favorite color is Mm-hmm. And I'm saying, well, now that I'm a paint manufacturer, every one of them, right? Because it's like all of these are my baby. I only, I, I'm in the 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 awesome position of being able to say, what cool colors do you want next, Jason? And I go and I make, them, right? So it's like, it's right. like I like these. These are great. And uh, and so all the colors are. But yeah, I, I mean, I use dark or dark purple, you know, a very very deep dark purple. I use probably on every model, um, but none of my models are purple. It's one of those colors that I use as a shade mixer uh, that I use as an underpaint for flesh uh, that I just use in shadows so much. So it's one of those utility colors that I think is is needed in every collection, even. And it's weird because a lot of people are like, oh, I just don't like purple. And I'm like, hmm. So none of my models look purple, but purple's in all of my models because it is that right. important of a color. Right. It, it it joins other colors so well. Um, you know, uh, I I. I don't, it's funny, I don't use much black, I don't use much white, uh, but those are some of our best paints, and when you need them, they're great. Um, but it's generally colors like yellow ochre, uh, again, is a fantastic mixer that has such a wide range of uses. So dark purple, yellow ochre, um, our jade. Our jade is just a color that finds its way on every model because it's such a great contrast color for little details like you're like hey i just what am i going to paint these eyes oh they need to be jade you know the lenses on your space marines need to be jade because it works with everything you know um the gem on this eldar guy was it need? it needs to be jade because jade works with everything so it's just one of those colors um but as a as a i don't find that i have a favorite like if you were to grab all the models on my bench and put them together and say what you know what color joins them all together i think you'd have a hard time finding one right uh, the method that I use to paint is one that's more creative, stormy disaster. And so it's just whatever I grab, um, we can make work. And because I just love playing with color. Right? If I could finger paint the models, I would. I know that James Wapple is always like talking about finger painting and he does sometimes. And I'm like, I'm right there with him. I'm like, I could if I could just finger paint the models, that would be about the only thing that could make it more fun is if my fingers could somehow get the detailing on there that I need. So because that would be. Eliminate the paintbrush altogether. That's my next invention. I'm going to figure that out. The finger sharpener. Oh, is that? Okay, good. We're back. Okay. Yeah, we, we got kind of frozen for a second there. Can you hear me, Jason? Oh, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Did you catch okay, that? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> I got to the finger painting point. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Once you started talking about finger painting, kind of blasted out. But that's okay, because... <laughs> You know, um, I co-host and I, a couple of years ago took a, a beginner's class with Roman Laplatte, and he was finger painting half the time on the model he was working on. And we were like, that's ridiculous. How come it can look that good with your fingers? And I can't even do that with a brush, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but it, it, it certainly takes it to a lot of fun. Now, uh, let me ask you this question. Do you ever get, because you paint so much, do you get to a point of painter's block and how do you kind of overcome that? Yeah, definitely. Um, Again, it's something that is, it affects everybody, right? And um, I think that the way that I attack it is I tell people to recognize it early, recognize the first sign of you being bored with what you're painting and, and try to figure out immediately what you can do to kind of course correct if it's you know hey i just need to put this particular model down and do the other squad guy or if you're doing line painting where you're painting all the boots brown and then all the cloaks green and then all the swords silver and you're just getting bored then stop that army for a minute and if you have another thing we all have other things to paint but in a lot of cases it might be that the the just the act of painting is becoming tedious 
And so no model is going to fix that because it's a it's a your brain thing, right? It's a, it's the thing between your ears that's causing the problem, not the, the model. And um, and so I say change course. Um, I'll start I'll, I'll do a build day whenever I'm finding like because we stream so often, there's a lot of prep that I have to do that says, OK, what's next? And if I found myself bogged down about how to answer what's next to paint on stream, then I know that I'm about to do a build day. Right. I know I'm about due to sit down and just build some models, you know, grab a box off the shelf of stuff that isn't even in the queue right now. It's not an army I'm thinking about. Maybe it's from years ago. Um, and put some models together, you know, clean some mold lines, put it together, immerse yourself in the hobby from a different direction with a different set of motor skills. It retunes your brain um, because your brain does get sometimes depend. And it's not because you're a particular type of person. I don't believe it could be the outside environment of the way your day has been. Maybe your the tasks you've been doing during the day have been tedious so that everything starts to look tedious. And so if you just kind of flip it over and reverse it and, and scrape some old lines and glue some stuff and glue your fingers together for an hour, and then maybe you'll be so tired of that, you'll want to get back to painting, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but I usually sit down and build for a while. And then I can look at the, as I'm building, I'm getting these ideas as most of us do in our head. Like you're putting the arms on and you're like, Oh, this pose I'm making is really cool. I can, if I chop a little bit off of the shoulder here, I can make the arm stick out a little bit further and a little bit of green stuff and do a little bit of sculpting. And by the end of it, you're like, now I know what color I want this guy and I already have a vision and that'll launch me back into mm -hmm. painting. Um, right. So I do a lot of that. I also listen to a ton of audiobooks. Um, so as I'm painting, uh, having a, you know, I'm big into fantasy and sci-fi fiction as most of us nerds are. And so I'll listen to a, a black library book. They're phenomenal on audiobook, most of them. And, uh, or I'm listening to like Joe Abercrombie series or, you know, the, the dark tower series. I've got a lot of things in kind of middle, uh, completion that I'm listening to. And I'll switch between books and I'll find myself getting lost in that. Uh, I can't do visual stuff because I'm paying too much attention to my model. So I can't like have a movie on in the background that, that bothers me, but I know a lot of people do that. So I think there's all sorts of things, but my biggest thing is to say, don't exit the hobby, right? Don't just put it down and then say, I'll come back next week. I find that for most people, that's kind of counterproductive because then you'll get used to not hobbying. Mm -hmm. So always find a way right. to be near the hobby, not in the hobby, like listening to the audio book, playing the games. I mean, we didn't I didn't mention that. Just go to game night. You know, I mean, well, it's tough right now. Right. right. <laughs> but, you know, our our yeah. social distancing right now. Um, you know, it's tough to go to game night. And that's and that's actually having a very big effect on me. Right. Because I'm like Wednesday is my game night. It is my release from my and I dread to say tedium of my job because my job is the hobby. But there is a tedium that comes attached with all the business and, and stuff that has to happen. So I love going out and we have game night every Wednesday. We play a bunch of games. We go out to dinner with the group. And that's my that's my release. But it's tied to the hobby directly. And so it gets me then amped up again to come back on Thursday and do the stream on Thursday and start painting. It. All right. Nice. Uh, but you also you hit one that uh, uh, models that we need. We need a, a good gunslinger model. Like a good Roland desk chain model would be awesome. Oh, and some, know, the some, some like the weird crabs on the beach, and oh yeah, I could see all sorts of stuff like the mutants in the cities and stuff. Yeah, right. Yeah, good target. The wolves of Kala would be great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure. The train. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> Blaine is a pain. Right? Blaine the mono. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. So our the motto of the podcast is better, braver, and happier. And so um, any kind of final parting tips that you could give our listeners to, to pursue that path? First off, I love that. We talk all the time about, you know, no having less fear when painting. You know, art, in my opinion, is chaos. And uh, harnessing chaos is tough for some people because they we, we spend so much of our days being orderly whether it's at your job, doing the right things in the right order, uh, at your house, doing the right things. Some people are just like that inherently, and there's nothing wrong with it. But to try to find that spark of chaos in your art is going to only kind of, I think, allow you to to get further. You know, I, I, I try to impress upon people, take away the fear of messing up. You know, we're not making heart valves. We're not making life support systems. We're having fun and we're making art and we're telling stories and whatever your story is, is great. Whatever tools you use to use it is great. Whatever gets the job done in a way that builds confidence for you is kind of my motto, right? Is that I want to help people become more confident with their painting. 
and we teach it in that chaotic realm. Do it. You know, hey, I was thinking about using this color. Do it. You know, do it. If you don't want to do it on the model that you're worried about messing up, do it on a piece of sprue. You know, do it on your hand. You know, do it on a piece of paper. See if these colors work together. Do you like them? Because that's all that matters. You know, stop worrying. I think maybe one of the biggest things um, is that I always talk about how your ability to judge painting increases exponentially faster than your ability to actually paint. And by that, I mean that once you get involved in any kind of art, uh, but especially like in our, our world of painting miniatures, there's going to be so much for you to look at so many now, especially with, you know, social media and, and content creation like it is so many avenues for you to go see wonderful things being made and your ability to recognize how wonderful they are comes much easier to you. Right. To say, oh, my God, that's beautiful. Then your ability to recreate that beauty with your own hands and it will become frustrating for people as they go through this process. And one of the biggest things to remember is that you're not trying to be the best painter. You're just trying to be the best painter you can be at that given time and stop judging yourself against the world. Um, there's so much to see and it's so easy to fall into. Oh, my gosh, I'll never be able to do that. Oh, my gosh, I've tried so hard and that just isn't working for me. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. And so then that painter's block we talked about comes a lot quicker. And so you have to kind of build your your own insulators against that and just look at the last model you painted and have that be the, the guideline for your next model. And then use all the wonderful tools that we have out in here, the internet, streams, content, pictures on Instagram, use all that as what they're intended to be, which are your muse to keep you going. Wow, that blue is fantastic. What blue did you use? Buy that color blue and start painting a model, you know? But don't do it with the idea that that color blue makes it look like that picture you saw. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and people right. just try. and we talk yeah. literally like it's funny. Today's stream after I talked to you is called Therapy Thursday, and on Therapy Thursday we deal with a lot of this. We talk about these kind of kind of painting psychology 101 and how not to get tripped up and get disillusioned because it's super easy, right? It's as humans we get we can get really bummed out quickly. If we if we have a whole lot of excitement built around something we love and then it crashes and burns <laughs> and you got to remember, art never crashes and burns, man. Whatever you did is art still. It may not be the art you wanted to do, but it can lead you to the art you want it to be. And I think that, you know, whatever words you need to put in whatever order to get you there, you know, that's what we want to do is help you. And I feel like that's what your guys goal is, too. So I'm I'm totally on board. I think what you guys are doing is great. Thank you very much. But you know what? Can you give us those Twitch times so that way our listeners can follow? Oh, sure. You... Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, first of all, it's a uh, Twitch dot uh, TV uh, slash Creature Caster underscore Slow Fuse. A lot of of mouthing in there. If you just type in Creature Caster, you'll find us. Um, and uh, we stream on Tuesdays at two p.m. Pacific, Thursdays at four p.m. Pacific, and Fridays at five p.m. Pacific, all times in the U.S. Of course. Um, so today at at four p.m. Thursday. Uh, we'll be live and we go anywhere from three to a bajillion hours during this whole <laughs> lack of adepticon thing we're going to stream this saturday um for as long as i can stand to be on stream we'll probably start around noon pacific this saturday and just go and go and go and go and i have no idea what we're going to be doing we're just going to be streaming forever so i haven't done that since i was doing video games it's about time we do a long stream to replace the uh the adepticon booth and hopefully a lot of people that wanted to talk to us and have me uh, critique their painting will come on and throw pictures up for us to look at and some cool community interaction will happen so no it's wonderful it's kind of a hard thing to have adepticon canceled i know a lot of companies were this was a big deal for a lot of different companies Brutal. and people and painters and stuff and um so you know that i was going to ask so the the new lines that come you know, that are launched you have a new paint set that came out right yep. that was going to be for adepticon um, what are the colors in that paint set, if you don't mind me asking? So this is our, our third expansion of the line for Pro Acryl. It has nine new colors in it. Uh, this will be a good test. You've put me on the spot. i got to remember all nine. Um, <laughs> it comes with uh, blue-black, which is a really good dark, dark, dark blue-black. <laughs> all of our paint names are exactly what you get in the bottle, so we don't do, like, goblin green. It's blue-black, because guess what? It's blue-black. Um, we, we have burnt sienna, which is just a really good, strong, standard art, you know, 100% pigment kind of color. Uh, very, very dark uh, reddish-orange. Um, and uh, then we've got black-green, 
which is a very good kind of dead on center, super dark green for basing. Uh, oh, gosh, here we go. Um, and then dark golden brown. So we've got four colors that kind of are in that shade arena and the golden brown. We already have golden brown in the line. Now it's dark golden brown complements that very well. It takes your browns and leathers into kind of more of a, uh, as you can tell from the name, a yellowy direction. Um, right. So four really dark colors that are great as shades. And then we've got five brighter colors that start with turquoise. Turquoise, just a really good, vibrant turquoise, uh, a color that doesn't exist as much as I think it should. Uh, and it works great as a highlight or a, on a standalone color as it own. It works really well with our jade. Uh, pale yellow, which is the, the next colors that I'm talking about are, are things that I use as tints to use in place of white as highlights um, right. on different color bases. So pale yellow is great on reds, obviously on yellows, browns. Uh, you can use it across the spectrum of warm colors and gives you a really, really good top level highlight. Plus, it's just a great mixer. Um, bright pale green, same thing in the realm of greens. It's like a like a how would you say like a mint green, like a super bright mint green. It's awesome. Yeah, I, uh, I thought sea foam when I kind of saw it. It's kind of yeah, kind of like a really bright sea foam. Yeah, a little less blue, but yeah, you're right on target with that. Uh, and then gray blue that complements our dark gray blue uh, and gets you into a lighter version of that. And then faded plum. And faded plum is a, a we use the term faded when it's very desaturated. Um, so it's more of a pastel. Uh, purplish with a little mm -hmm. bit of red in it. And it works, again, really, really good as a way to start highlighting whatever purple you like to get it to stay on hue. Um, I'm a big fan of not using white too much because it desaturates and moves the color away from its base too quickly. So I try to use very, very bright versions of on hue colors. And by on hue, I mean, like if you're highlighting purple, take something that's sort of purple and very, very bright and use it to start getting your highlights to keep your color on target. And so that's what half of this set really is. And you'll, you'll see that's kind of the way I treat the paint line is we've got good dark bases and real good bright uh, tints for these these color ranges. And then our colors just mix so well, you can create whatever you want on the in-between. So Nice. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you taking the time out of the busy schedule. Definitely. This has been a blast. I've, I've really enjoyed it. I'm glad to, to see you guys doing this, and I'm uh, happy to help any way I can. This is fantastic. So Dan and I would like to thank Jason Craze from Slow Fuse Gaming for joining us today. It was an awesome interview. We learned a ton. You can follow them at Slow Fuse Gaming uh, on the internet, uh, either Facebook, Instagram. They also have a Twitch, which will put the hours for their Twitch in the show notes. If you have a question, comment, or concern, want to talk about anything that's related to the topic, feeling lonely with the COVID-19 isolation, drop us a line at listening to paint dry at gmail.com. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Listening to Paint Dry as well. So remember, the best way to become a better, braver, and happier painter is to find the tools that work for you. And so the great brush debate is over. We're all winners. Till next time. See ya. Listening to Paint Dry with Mike and Dan is a production of LTPTWMD. All rights reserved. No portion of this recording may be used without the express written consent of the host. The music is Death by a Thousand Questions by Springtide. Download from the free music archive on a non-commercial attribution share alike basis. All views and opinions expressed in the show are solely the views and opinions of the person who said them. All celebrity voices, if any, were impersonated and done so poorly.